And for those of you that are here, uh, we are uh, now into the Lent series in our messages. And so if you have your scripture with you, please turn with me uh, to the Gospel of John chapter 2, reading from verse 13 to 22. Reading from Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 13 to 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others uh, sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all uh, from the temple area both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold dove, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remember that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is God's word for us this morning. Friends, will you pray with me as we continue to hear for God's word uh, this morning? Let's pray together. God of wisdom, you speak through the law and the prophets to teach us how to live. Send us your Holy Spirit to teach us truth for our times and wisdom for our lives. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, friends, uh, the text of the Gospel of John is sort of like our weather uh, in recent times. Remember how this chapter began? It kind of took place in a nice family setting, a wedding. And, you know, they say everybody loves a wedding, right? And a miracle takes place, but it happens very privately. And uh, it's wonderful in that way. Uh, But as we get to the latter part of this chapter in chapter two, it's not so private anymore. And uh, it kind of makes you wonder, what was that all about? (laughs) It's like a whirlwind. It's like the windy days that we had uh, earlier this week. And so from very tranquil setting to now, it becomes very violent, if you will, and, and it becomes very exciting and kind of leaves people wondering, what was that all about? You ever been there? You ever feel like your life is, you know, up and down and things are happening? You kind of feel like God is there, but you wonder, what's, what's going on? What's going on? And friends, that's one of the reasons why we read the scripture. That's one of the reasons why we go to Bible studies. That's the reason, one of the reasons why we listen to sermons. That's the reason why hopefully we have also Christian friends, people that are mature in the Lord, to also speak into our lives, to make sense of things. And it seems like in the scripture today too, when things were happening, they really weren't sure what was happening. They see some allusion to the verses from the Old Testament, from their history, and there's hints and things that are around, but they don't seem to really see it. And uh, I'm sure that also is experience of many of us. You know, at times we feel like we kind of get it, but we don't. And we need some clarity. And so I love it when people pray for that word, Lord, please give us clarity of mind. 
right? Because a lot of times we feel like we're a little bit in a fog. Well, anyway, today we're told uh, in verse 13 that it was almost time for the Jewish Passover. And do you know that in the Gospels, especially the Gospel of John, that this Passover is significant? Have you noticed that Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of John begins in the, uh, the Jewish festival or the holiday of the Passover? And did you notice also Jesus' ministry ends where? In the holiday of Passover. So this is a context and the backdrop of Jesus' ministry beginning and Jesus' ministry ending. Do you think this is by chance or by fluke, or do you think that the Passover and what it stands for gives some significance to what Jesus is doing? Of, of course he is. And so, you know, um, for us, uh, for me as a Korean person, January 1st, has a certain kind of cultural connotation. And um, when I was explaining this to a Japanese friend, uh, she said, oh, we don't do that. And, and she said, well, that, that's great. So when January 1st hits, do you think that day has different meaning for each of us? Right? Of course, it, it has different meaning. I know in Korea, we would go visit family and have a wonderful meal together. And there's a special meal that we eat and do you know in Korea, back in the days, I think they changed it recently, when the calendar turns over to the new year, everybody ages one year. We don't wait till your birthday. So they always often ask, what year were you born in? And, and so there's kind of communal sense that we all age together. So those of you who are holding back and you're 39 forever, uh, you probably don't like to be in Korea because the first day you age, you know, one year. And so everybody says as a joke that after you eat uh, this food, you gain one year. And then after that, we go through the celebration of wishing our elders a happy new year, and they bless the kids, uh, the young people, and give them some new year's money, and th this is what we do. So th there's a context. And so when we say new year, as Korean people, uh, with another Korean people, there's a shared kind of context. And the Jewish people who knew that this is a Passover right away, they would have gone through all the things what the Passover means. If you are a God-fearing Jewish person, where do you go for the Passover? You go to Jerusalem. There's going to be some travel involved, right? Um, do you know during this time, they conservatively say that the population of Jerusalem in normal times is about 100,000 to about 350, okay? Okay. But when the festivals happen and the Jewish people that are scattered all over Israel end up coming to Jerusalem along with foreigners and Gentiles who are god fears who also came and came into Gentile courts to worship God, can you just imagine how much this city gets ballooned up and how busy and exciting it becomes? Some people say up to about 3 million people, you, you know, would descend or fall upon the city. So it would balloon up to, who knows, 30, uh, 30 or 10 times, depending on how you do the calculation. But if we go really conservative, let's say from 100,000 to a little bit million plus, that's about 10 times busier than what you would find it normally. Where do you house all these people? You know, I often wish that I had family living like in Hawaii, uh, another person living in BC, another person maybe in Korea, uh, not for their sake <laughs> or, you know, for my sake so that maybe I could just go visit and have cheap lodging when I go visit, you know. And uh, uh, so if you're a Jewish person, you would love to have a family living in Jerusalem at this point. Um, you know, because I'm sure lodging prices will go up. And uh, those of you who maybe have used the services of Uber and Lyft, you know that the price is not the same all the time, right? When do the prices go up? When there's a huge, you know, when the demand is higher, the prices go up, right? And depending on also which car uh, you order when you're using your app, prices also change. And so depending on demand and supply, the prices are always changing. Now, 
I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember this. I'm just joking, by the way. Uh, I'm sure you are. But remember in, uh, some years back in Toronto, we had that blackout. Remember that? And uh, I remember the subway was all out and people were walking in droves on Young Street. And I usually don't do this, but I actually, you know, uh, got some, what is it? I, what is it? I allowed somebody to get into my car and drove them up the street a bit, right? But during that time, you know, a lot of people were kind enough to, you know, give water to people and, and whatnot. But, you know, would that have also been a good time to mark up your water if you're a grocery store? <laughs> What if you are an Uber driver? Would that be a good time to mark it up? How about concert tickets these days? What happens? You get a middleman, middleman, a middleman, another middleman. And, and, and now people are paying like, what, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars for like a concert ticket? It's just crazy. Whenever you get more and more middlemen in the middle, uh, you know, the prices go up. It's just crazy. Why am I sharing this with you? You see, because if I, I'm not that much of a concert goer, but boy, if I had to pay $1,000 to go watch, I don't know, Taylor Swift or whatever, as I buy that ticket, I probably would be cursing, right? Uh, not a pulpit language, right? I, I probably would be very upset. And I would be probably cursing those middlemen who are driving up these prices. But because I really want to go to that concert, I'm willing to dish it out. But I'm cursing at the people in the middle, in the middle, in the middle, who kept selling and, you know, take a percent here, percent here, percent here. I'll be cursing them. Even with a concert ticket, I'd be upset. But you know what's happened with the city of Jerusalem during this time? I'm sure the innkeepers were making, you know, good money. And maybe you're a hot dog vendor. Maybe, hey. This is once, three times in a year where I could have a little bit of a bumper. Yeah, I'm going to lift up the prices a little bit. Yeah, I think I could get away charging maybe 10% more, 50% more than I usually do. And maybe people are in the business of making money. You can kind of understand it a little bit. Because that's what they do. They're in business to make a profit. That's their livelihood. So even though you don't like it, maybe you're willing to give a little bit of grace. But friends, what if this was happening at the temple? What if this was happening at the church? Imagine every time you give an offering here at Bridalwood, somebody sitting at the front say, oh no, we don't take that. There's a Bridalwood currency that you need to buy in order to give offering. And by the way, that would be extra 10% thank you. Hey, are you complaining? Still cheaper than what they charge you for tips at restaurants, right? (coughs) Uh, but they say, back in those days, as people came from different places using different currency, they were charging 10, 12% surcharges to get them to exchange the money to the currency that was acceptable here. And back in the days, people also, depending on you know, what their economic circumstances were, would bring about different animal for sacrifice to the Lord. But... This was very inconvenient, wasn't it? Especially if you're coming from a faraway place and you had to bring your own animals. Well, when you're traveling, do you like to travel light or do you like to travel heavy? You know, especially if you're going on a plane, it's nice if you don't have to check in any bags. It's just easier to get around the airport that way, right? If you have to, you know, lug this animal, you have to bring feed, have to feed it and take care of it, water and so forth. It's just a lot of work. Especially have your children, maybe adults, other people, dependents. It's just a lot of stuff if, if you're traveling. And, and, and to make thing, the matters worse, that when people brought the sacrifice to the temple, often it had to be certified. And the priest, high priest, who was now starting to make a lot of money, the leadership that was making money and gaining power, through the economic opportunities that was there with the temple tax, searcher charging on the exchange rates, and the money that they made uh, through these animals that needed to be sacrificed to atone them for their sins. They saw an opportunity. So do you think it's to their interest to find, nitpick at the animals that you bring from home and say, denied, declined? It doesn't fit the standard. 
Uh, something wrong with the tail, something wrong with the ear, something wrong with the eye color. Uh, or just find you know, frivolous reasons to say that this animal does not fit the bill. So it wouldn't be certified. So people just found it more convenient to come and actually buy the animals that's been declared certified at the temple. Do you think this became quite lucrative for the leadership? And I'm sure they would say, this is God's kingdom business. This is God's kingdom business. Hey, the temple doesn't run for free. Hey, this church, we gotta pay for the electricity. You know, the asphalt on the parking lot, it's not gonna be forever. We're gonna have to, you know, repair that someday. Yes, we understand, but how much? How much is enough? And I suppose it came to the point where no longer for them, the temple and all that it stands for became the reason, the priority for their gathering. They became profit-driven. Of course, we don't do that in our modern days, do they? Right? You know, I'm sure somewhere in the Bible, Jesus said, whatever you have received freely, you know, give it away freely. But I find a lot of times, you know, I look at these Christian conferences and I'm thinking, why are they charging so much? Why is it $500? Why are they promoting their book so much? Why does a pastor need a jet to get around? Like first class not good enough for them? Business class at least? Economy? Maybe they're just too posh for that. I mean, because who flies an economy, please? Surely not a pastor. Of course, in modern day, we don't think about that, do we? But that's what it become. The leadership became profit-driven, and the people who would come and try to find favor with God, what for? For their livelihood, for their profit. Because surely if God is pleased with them, then God would give them a new job and give them new business opportunity, and they'll become rich. And, well, after all, they have to come back and to be able to, you know, purchase these cattle and doves to uh, be able to worship God, no? So everybody would make and justify themselves. And Jesus would look at this broken system, and he was absolutely upset. Friends, not many people believe what happens next is a miracle. But I actually think it is. Jesus, uh, with a cord, a whip, what does he do? He, he scatters the coins and money changes and overturned their tables and to those who sold doves. And doves are mentioned because doves were actually provided for people who were poor. Right? If you can afford a cow and a sheep, I think you're either first, you know, doing well financially or at least middle class. Those who are, you know, could only afford a dove are financial, you know, in dire straits. But even then they were, you know, making money off. And so Jesus said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? And Jesus becomes very violent. He becomes very terrible to the people who are in the receiving end. And so in the Gospel of John, this is how he begins. And you notice also one of the last acts that Jesus does in his ministry before he's crucified on the cross, what does he do when he comes to Jerusalem for the one last time? He goes into the temple and does the same thing. Why is he so zealous for the temple? Kind of goofy, but uh, you know, you know, your pastor uh, has a weird sense of humor. Uh, as I was thinking about Jesus' zeal for the temple, you know what came to my mind? Not Michael Bolton, but the song that he ripped off and sang from before. It's called When a Man Loves a Woman. <laughs> There's a song for every occasion, isn't there? But the song goes, when a man loves a woman, can't keep his mind on nothing else. 
He would trade the world for the good things he found. If she is bad, he can't see it. She can do no wrong and turn his back on his best friend if he puts her down. All right? When a man loves a woman, he spends his very last dime and trying to hold on to what he needs. He give up all his comforts uh, and sleep out in the rain if she said that's the way it ought to be when a man loves a woman. You know, love drives us to do crazy things. I guess in John, we call that word a zeal. Christ was zealous for his father. And I suppose when our relationships become strong with someone, when our maturity, our spiritual maturity, you know, grows, we can become zealous for the things of God. Things that gave us pleasure in the past, we're ashamed of it. Things that we didn't care for before, now it pains us, it moves us, and makes us stop. The fact that this temple has been turned upside down and has become a profit-driven, kind of like a business-like institution, it really got to God. And it really got to Jesus. But what if we were to change the lyrics of this song to when a person loves God and loves all the things that his kingdom stands for, all that God's righteousness, his mercy stands for? What are they willing to do? What would they start loving? What are they, what would they start willing to do? And what are some things that they would turn their back on? because they have found new love and new priorities. For Jesus, he knew he would be stirring up some influential. He knew that he would be stirring up some powerful people and would start to make some of the people's lives uncomfortable. And I guess as Christians, sometimes we get into these kind of good trouble, don't we? We could live in silence and have no confrontation, have no impact. But if there is going to be an impact, sometimes there has to be a crash. Right? Sometimes you might have to call somebody out. You might have to point out something. You might have to settle for a little bit of discomfort in order for a better outcome. And that's what it seems like Jesus is doing. The status quo cannot stand. People have lost sight of what, if, what this really means. I almost think of the situation like this. Could you imagine um, that if you have, let's say, a cottage, and you haven't been there in a while, and uh, you decide to go there for the weekend, and you said, well, that's strange. What's that car parked on, on the driveway? It's not just one, two, or three. And the, and the lights are on. And if my ears are not fully made, I hear music. And you go inside, and there's strangers. And you think, well, maybe one of my children is using this cottage without having asked me, and maybe these are their friends. And you look everywhere, but you don't see any familiar faces. And they don't even ask who you are. They just go on as if it's their cottage. What should you do? Are you upset by this? Or do you say, ah, ah they're having a good time. I just drive back home. Don't want to disturb them. I mean, is that what you would do? Never. Never. <laughs> It's time to put down the boom and, you know, let, let justice come. It's time to settle accounts, isn't it? I sometimes wonder if this is how God feels about his creation. You know, ownership in econ economics is simply control. If you own it, you control it. And since none of us created anything or none of us created life, none of us entered into this life under our control, 
We don't own life. We can't give life. Only one who can do that is God Almighty. And what we are also taught is that when life is broken and the inevitability of sin that spirals, that brings about death and destruction to our world, it seems we need help from outside to correct it. We can't fix it. Only God can do that. And that is why people come to the temple. And that's why people come to the house of God. Remember, God has a long memory. Remember that word house of God where it first appears? Genesis. Remember Jacob? is in the whole world of trouble and is running away from his brother, sleeps that night in a dream. He sees a ladder of God connecting him to heaven and earth. Next day he wakes up, sets up an altar. This this is the house of God and I didn't even realize it. God was with him and he had a connection with God Almighty that heaven up there came down here for Jacob and was watching over him. But it is in Jesus Christ that we fully get to know that connection up there to down here and down here to up there. And it is not the old Passover where the sacrifice has to be made over and over and over again because it's incomplete. And over and over again, because it's pointing to something that is ultimate. No longer will the doorpost have its blood smear by the sacrifice of an animal. But somebody else will be not hung on a different wooden post. And he will become a gateway. And it will not be the blood of sheep or cattle or dove. But it will be the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that would be smeared on that post. And his price that he pays will become a gateway for you and I, a temple where we'll be able to engage God and be restored. Not for profit, but for relationship, for worship, for humility, for grace sake. Friends, the temple that Jesus found is nothing like what it was meant to be. But he fights. He drives it out. He cleanses so that we would know of a better gift. Christ has become a temple for us through his body. The disciples, they don't see everything right now. It feels like a fall. But the wonderful thing is, we hear that after his death, right? After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. So friends, we keep a double vision. We keep our sights here on earth in the situation we find ourselves. But always make sure to keep your sights above upon the Lord, that he may give us a clarity of mind as to what is happening and as how we are to walk with God as he's loving us and us loving him. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you so much that, Lord, you care for your people enough to the point that you are willing to engage us in history. Lord, as you have saw the groaning and the pain of Israel of old as slaves and the cruel empire of Egypt, you came down to save them. In the same way, you see us, your people, weighed down by the brokenness of sin and the systems 
that we live under. And then, Lord, we are so glad that you hear our sighs, you hear our cries, and that, Lord Jesus, we're so grateful you came down and that broke away and destroyed the broken system so that we might be able to engage you and see you for who you are. So, Lord, we wonder what systems or what ideas that we live under where it also needs some fixing. We pray, Lord, as we uh, lift up ourselves, our church to you in humility, that you would come and you would have way with us. Drive away all the things that hinders from us drawing near to you. Uh, and we pray, Lord, instead that you would replace it uh, with all things uh, that, Lord, uh, that receives your approval. We thank you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.